Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The DL. I am your host, Tyler Robertson, the CEO and founder of Diesel Laptops. And if you've been listening to the last couple episodes, you'll know I've talked a lot about change, our industry, keeping up with it, what's happening, all those things that are going on. And I think one of the interesting things when I look back here a little bit is COVID has this ripple effect that's going on. And in the case when it comes to truck parts and e-commerce, I don't think it changed where it was going. I think it changed the speed at which it was going to get there eventually. And all of a sudden, there's a lot more interest in people doing things over the internet. So I thought, who better to bring on the show than pretty much one of the foremost experts in doing this thing with e-commerce and truck parts online. So I invited David here, who is the CEO and founder of Find It Parts. So David, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Tyler. Happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I, I think it's really interesting. And, and the reason I say you kind of the forefront of this is I think give a little background on you and, and find it parts, because this isn't something that just popped up last year when everyone decided to start buying online. You've been doing this for a little bit and, and making some good inroads. Yeah. So just to give you a little bit of history, I grew up in the brick and mortar world. So I grew a family business or I joined a family business when I was 20 and we grew the business from one location to 23 branch locations. Very typical with most other aftermarket distributors. You know, we had 23 stores, we had about 100 counter people and inventory beyond what I would like to have had. And it was a conventional business. We always tried to be ahead of our competitors, but it was the old school brick and mortar way. So I ended up selling my company to a large private equity company that rolled into one of the largest aftermarket companies today. And after my non-compete, I always felt that there was a better way by which to locate parts. In my brick and mortar world, what gave me the idea was that 20% of the needs that my customer had, I wasn't able to satisfy within my inventory. So I had a lot of buyouts. So I started the business because I was looking to satisfy that 20% of the parts people wouldn't normally be able to locate. And that's really the genesis of Find a Part. So we've been at this for about 11 years now, and it's been hard. So we've been growing year after year. And I'm happy to say that as terrible COVID was for society in general, it happened to have been great for our business. It really put us, you know, we're fortunate, everyone in our space, that we are an essential business. So no one stopped doing business. But I think because people were home and the way they changed their buying behaviors, it's transcended over to the heavy duty business. So I think the tailwinds of COVID has been very helpful to us by unlocking people's insecurities about buying parts online for their vehicles, as opposed to buying shoes to go running. So I know one of the complexities that's out there, it's, you know, people compare us to automotive a lot, right? So automotive, I have a Toyota Camry. They built the same Camry for, for 10 years, whatever it is. And they're pretty much all the same, same parts, same part numbers. There's not a lot of variance, not, not a lot of custom ability to do that. And then you look at truck, right? And really every truck could have a different engine, a different transmission, some different features, some different that. And, and that essentially creates millions of available parts that could potentially go on that truck. So when you talk about the stock outs, that, that makes sense to me. And I, I see that and it's just a different thing. And I understand there's common parts and there's uncommon parts and we all understand that. But I, I think there's a lot of other variables going in here. So for example, just this week, I had a customer that, that kind of had a special project going on and I wanted to validate a couple, a couple part numbers because I didn't believe the, the cross references are right. So I'm like, well, I'll call the dealer and see what the dealer says. So I, I call the first dealer and this is a local dealer, OEM dealer. And it took me 12 minutes. I was on hold for 12 minutes in the endless cycle of attendant voicemail, attendant voicemail, attend. And it kept saying, you're in Q1. You're the next yeah. available representative. I'm like, okay, cool. They'll answer 12 minutes. And I finally just gave up on hang up the phone. Mm -hmm. What is going on there? Cause I don't think that's a unique story that people experience when they're calling those traditional brick and mortars. Like what, what's driving that, that, that response that people see sometimes at these dealerships or aftermarket companies, is there an underlying problem that, that, that causes that in your opinion? It's hard to speak for them, but I think people are busy. And I think that, you know, in a conventional brick and mortar dealership, for instance, 
you have the same people that are at the counter that are helping customers on the telephone. So you'll have a customer walk in in front of them and dump some parts on his counter. At the same time, he's getting a telephone call. So he's trying to balance three things at once and one person doesn't get all of their attention. So that's what I find. A lot of times when you call a dealer and that's a distributor also, and I'm not speaking ill of distributors because I was one and I had hundreds of counter people working for me. But you know, people are dyslexic. They enter the wrong number, they enter it wrong. They're so busy, they enter it, they say, I'm sorry, we don't have it. And they hang up the phone. So I'm finding that all the time. I'm finding that if you call a dealership, you're looking for a part, they say, I'm sorry, we don't have it. And then you say to them, well, did you check your other stores? Hold on a second. And then they'll check another store and you'll say, no, I'm sorry. Well, did you check the DC? And it's almost like you're hassling them and they're like, oh, okay, well, give me a second. And to your point, put me on hold. I may or may not get disconnected. So I find that the whole flow of that information is clunky and it depends upon how good that particular distributor or dealer is. Yeah. And I a hundred percent agree with you. That information's in multiple places. I, I worked at a dealership. I was a parts manager over a million dollar a month parts department for a couple of years. And one of the trends that, that I saw was the fact that these parts people, I mean, we were literally the, the path to becoming a parts professional on the counter. It was you first, maybe they're a driver delivering parts and then they go yeah. work in the warehouse for a little bit. And then they come sit with another experienced parts guys for a little bit. Yeah. And then they become a parts guy, right? So it's, yeah. this, it's this long, grueling path with no formal education. And I remember trying to find good parts guys and it's really tough. And all of my good guys were retiring. Yeah. So have you seen that too, kind of in your world and people that you've worked with? Is that another challenge they have going on? Yeah, I mean, that's what we're experiencing because, you know, um, a counter person has to take 10 years being as a journeyman underneath a senior counter person. And until they get confident enough to really feel comfortable with parts, so much of what they do is visual identification in the aftermarket. You know, from an OE world, you can always look something up by VIN number. That makes it pretty simple. But as soon as it's not VIN driven, it's required upon a person to kind of decode it. And those are some of the big challenges in our space today. Like you mentioned about looking up a Camry, there are no taxonomies or normalized ways by which you can drill down and locate a part. So those are some of the challenges. Now, manufacturers have come up with their own website. So you might go to a Bendix or a Meritor or a Haldex, and you're incumbent, it's incumbent upon you to learn five or six or 10 different catalog programs to be able to get everything you need. So there is no one central repository for that information. And the training is really predicated upon the business, you know, how good they train their people. So it's a hard, it's a problem for us all in the industry today. So I remember being a parts manager and I, I just become a parts manager. I was a service guy. They might run parts for a while. I, I learned a lot, but I remember I, I hired a new guy. He had worked like for five or six years at a, in a, in a parts counter position at another dealership and moved in, moved, you know, he was out of state, moved in. Um, and I remember it was like the second or third day there and a customer came. I can't remember if it was like a brake shoe or a camshaft. It kind of just threw up on the counter and goes, I need one. And the guy goes, oh, what's your VIN? And the guy's like, it's off a trailer. And this yeah. guy with five or seven experiences, like, I, I, I don't know how to help you. <laughs> yeah, yes, because exactly. that, that was the OEM world is if you don't have a VIN, you can't look it up. I have no idea how these aftermarket professionals, they're truly professionals. There's a lot of knowledge you need to look up all the variety of trailer parts, truck parts, accessories, all of these things. And it's yeah. a long path for those people. And and even more so, so you're you you had brick and mortar and now you're an online retailer. How how do you guys do it? How do you help customers figure out what they need? Because that's one of the big challenges in our industry. Yeah, so we're evolving. So when we started, we were the best search if you knew the part number. So if you know the part number or if you know the cross-reference number or the manufacturer and maybe a keyword, our site works fantastic. Um, but if you're looking to drill down for a brake shoe, like if you want to find a Q brake shoe hardware kit, that data and that content has not been well organized by our suppliers. So we really look at discovery as one of the biggest challenges in the market today. It's like, if I don't know my part number, how can I figure out what I need without having to give my VIN number to the dealer or having to take my part to the distributor? And that's really what our focus has been. So. We're really working on, as you know, auto care is coming up with new pies information. 
and we're looking to adopt that in our database today. So you can drill it down by category. It might be a break valve, and then within valves, there might be a bunch of different subcategories. So we're looking to implement the PIES categories and continuously build content so you can get to a, a smaller subset of SKUs by which to select from. But this is a really big problem and one that we're dedicating millions of dollars for discovery to hopefully take it to the next step so that young people that have computer skills could be almost as capable of someone that's been doing the same job for 20 years. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I always tell people like technology is going to save this thing. <laughs> like that, yeah. It has to. There, there's not like we can go produce a bunch more parts professionals. And I even say it on the diesel tech side. Technology has to help save the diesel technician shortage. It's just, it's too late for anything else at this point besides that to happen. Um, and we we fully agree with everything you're saying, right? It, it's got to be easy for people to find the own parts they need. And at the end of the day, people want options. And if yeah. they if they can't, like my story with the dealers, I, I don't know if that's typical or not, right? But I know there's some companies where they're just slammed all the time and they can't answer the phones quick enough. I'll yeah. even say the company I used to work for when I was a parts manager there was, there was a point where we just let the voicemail fill up so that no more voicemails could go into it because we didn't have time to answer them anyway, right? It was it was yes. that mad attitude, which is not a great attitude to have, but it, it's no. the unfortunate reality of, of where it was was at and everything. So, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a while for everything to happen here. And I, I can say, you know, we're an auto care member as well. Um, and I think in my perception, what they did with that Aces and Pies is they took what they had in the automotive and at first they tried to just jam HD into it. And then I think they're finally kind of realizing, okay, this thing's a little bit different than automotive. We gotta, we gotta make some tweaks and adjustments there. But in in your opinion, you know, how important is that data? Like, is that is that an important thing? And will the manufacturers, do you think, will they adhere to the standards and try to give that information? Are they getting pressure from other people? How how do you think that's gonna go? Well, I sure hope so, because at the end of the day, it's the manufacturer that have to drive this content. Because, you know, um, if, you rem if you remember back to the old days, Euclid made the best catalog for brake parts. And Euclid was an independent company. And, and Meritor, for instance, may not had the best catalog at the time. And that's why Meritor bought Euclid, because they wanted the best catalog in the industry. And then time went by and all the people from the catalog department at Euclid ended up leaving and then Meritor lost all of the great traction that they had with the acquisition they made. So what I find is, is that a lot of companies put together the content to build their catalogs and then that information goes away. It went to the catalog department and they didn't do anything. So what and me as a consumer, when I'm going to buy things, I might go online and do discovery find out what I'm looking for, read about those products, and then I may buy it from wherever I'm comfortable buying. It doesn't necessarily mean they'll buy it and find a parts. They may go down the street and buy it for from Freightliner or from a Truck Pro or from a Fleet Pride. So I think the manufacturers, it's important for them to build the best data and content because as to your point, counter people aging out, if the suppliers don't do their job, then they're going to be relying on people like you and I. And if that's the case, then their brand won't hold the same stature that if they curated the content themselves. So I continuously say to the suppliers, get better images. We need the kind of content that would drive a Best Buy or an Amazon so an informed buyer really understands what it is they're buying. Yeah, and I'll I'll paint some you know a little bit of a picture behind what you just said there, and you know you work with manufacturers we do so I'll kind of tell my side of it here. But I see some manufacturers that are that are more automotive, standard motor products, Dorman. Mm -hmm. Those guys have great data. They they know they need the multiple pictures, the three sixty yeah. images, the aces, the pies. They, they they get it. And then I can tell you we we just talked to a manufacturer uh, last week. And they do about 150 million ish in revenue a year. So it's a pretty fairly sized manufacturer. And we're like, hey, we want to get your crosses and absorb them and, and do these things. Like, yeah, 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 sure. They give us to them and it has their part number and then it has competitor part number. So we went back to them. We're like, well, who who's the manufacturer of those competitors? I'm like, well, well, we, we don't have that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, okay, you, you guys got a little bit of the picture. Um, and there's another manufacturer worked with a multi, like international company, billion plus in revenue. And um, we, we got their crosses 
And a lot of the crosses were just wrong, like fake part yeah. numbers or mashed up part numbers. Or they'd say it's an international part, but it'd be a Caterpillar part number. I'm like, we're like, hey, we think your dad is wrong. And they're like, no, no, we've been using that for years. And we're like, we know it's 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 wrong. <laughs> so yeah. they, they got some work to do. But I think they're, I, I, the conversation is different than two years ago. I don't. Hopefully you see this too. Like now they're like, yes, we need to get our data right. It's important. Two years ago, they're like, why do we need to do that? Have exactly. you seen similar stuff? And I think the difference in automotive is the big box people like CarQuest, AutoZone, Napa, they require that information from the suppliers to be able to post their information on their website. So if you want to do business with Walmart, you have to do business the Walmart way. Yeah. Well, because people on our side of the space that weren't digitized, there really was no demand for that data and that content. So it kept getting put on the back burner. So I think now that more people are requesting that information, they're kind of scrambling to put it together, but I don't think necessarily they're doing it with the end all in mind. So they're just scrapping together pieces of data as opposed to looking at it and saying, okay, we used to be a catalog driven company. How could we create the digital assets that will drive other people's catalogs? And it's only until then that they understand what the change in the market's going to be, that they really put the time and resources behind that. Yeah. And I, I think I'll go back to what you said earlier. People don't want to go to 10 or 15 or 20 websites yeah. to figure out what they need. They want to go to one place, figure out what they need, click a button to buy it. And exactly. I know I know in some of your blog posts and things I've read about you, you've you've mentioned Rock Auto. They made it easy is what they did, right? They're not they the, they're not the cheapest. They just made it really, really easy for people to buy. And that sounds like what you're trying to do with Find It Parts. It is. And we're constantly evolving. So we have some new things we're going to introduce, introduce right at the beginning of the year. We're looking to just take it to the next step. We want our ultimate goal is to empower the end user, whoever that might be, to be able to self-identify their parts. So we're gonna throw everything at it. Now we already have customer service people to answer the phones as you would as a dealership or a distributor that they all do a very good job. You know, it depends upon the distributor. Some are amazing and some aren't so amazing. So our goal is to continuously make the experience similar to what you expect on your best website. So when you go to Best Buy and you're looking at TVs, you better see a picture. And you certainly want to know, you know, what's the resolution? Is it LED or not? You know, how long is the extension cord? So right now you're shooting blind. So I think that's what's so important to get the content. So the consumers know. Yeah, I mean, I think we can both agree it's going to get digitized, right? And I, I think when you, when you looked on that path and you say, okay, that's going to happen, I, I don't think people quite understand how that changes the landscape because all of a sudden, like you just said, you know, it, it gets more difficult. I, mean, I think retail is going to be around for for a long, long time. I don't think brick and mortar yes. is going anywhere. But all of a sudden now, they don't got to compete with people in their town or their city. They got to compete with people online that have lookup tools, easy to use, easy to buy. They don't have to send a hold for 15 minutes. Yes. And, you know, and that, that makes it difficult for those retailers. And I, I think some of the smart retailers that we talk to, they're they're trying to figure it out. They they realize, and it's funny because every time I talk to one, it ends up being someone that that's younger. It's not it's not the the sixty or seventy year old guy that that owns a retail store that that's thinking that way. It's the guy that just we just talked to someone that just just bought bought into a store, right? And he's like, okay, we need to digitize or else we're we're screwed ten years from now. We got to figure this out. And I think that hybrid models is really what's going to work. And I, I look at I look at Amazon, right? Amazon's buying brick and mortar. To, to have that yeah. presence and, and Walmart's trying to build an e-commerce present to be like Amazon, right? So there, there's like yeah. a race going on there. Do you, yeah. do you feel the same way or do you think things will change and everyone's just going to buy online and forget brick and mortar? Where do you, where do you see this going? You know, someone said that to me the other day. No, I mean, from my perspective, there is always a place for brick and mortar and a story because number one, you have relationships, you're down the street, you come, you, you visit the fleet daily, weekly, however, whatever the cadence is of your sales visit, or your delivery vehicles. So I believe that there is always gonna be a place for brick and mortar. There is always gonna be the need for same day delivery. I don't think that's gonna change. I think what's gonna change is that buyers require more from their from their suppliers. So if the, my advice to the suppliers or the distributors rather is you need to start changing with the times because you need to start meeting the customers where they wanna be. So you have to make sure that you provide the tools your customers need to buy. So when I talk to a lot of the people that supply for me um, and they say, well, I'm their competitor, 
I said, I'm not your competitor. The customer has chosen to buy differently. So if you don't, if you don't change your business to accommodate that, I'm going to get that person's business. I'm not gunning for your business. If you do all the right things you need to do to run your business and your customers want to buy online and you provide that opportunity, they're going to buy from you. So I do believe everyone needs to change and we're always reinventing ourselves and our businesses. Yeah. And I, I think that what you just said is really what happened at Diesel Laptops on our diagnostic tool side. So when I first got into this, nobody was really pushing diagnostic tools online and doing online marketing and, and videos and all the things we were doing. They were going around store to draw, basically door to door, show the tool, try to sell it. Right. Yeah. And then and then we come along and we're like, well, that model, that's great, but we can't scale and, and sell in volume doing that way. So we're going to do this Internet thing and, and see if we can do it this way. And I remember um, because there was, was one brand we were really selling a lot of when as we first got going. There's still our, our primary brand that we sell. Um, and I remember like kind of all the other distributors kind of had a meeting with that manufacturer without us there. And they were all complaining about us. Right. Diesel laptops is doing this. They're selling that. And at the end of the day, the manufacturer's like, well, they're they're selling above list price and they're selling more than all of you guys combined in the last 12 months. So you guys need to be better at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and that's really, and a couple of them have, they've, they stepped up and said, yep, yeah, we're going to get aggressive and better. And we're gonna make it easier to do business. And we're going to do better marketing. And I think that's really what competition does is it, it makes everyone be a little bit better. And no one company is going to have a hundred percent market share of this $34 billion a year truck parts industry. Right. And so I watch what you're doing and, and candidly, um, you've really kind of figured out how to communicate to customers differently than they were being communicated to. You really do lead the charge from a social media perspective. I think you've done a great job. You, you know, you have a very big audience. You do a lot of ways to connect to your to your customers. You know, you do these webinars, you do training videos. You really are able to provide that service to the customers, your customers. I see you have training classes. You have a multitude of ways that people can engage. And typically, a lot of brick and mortar is. Well, we'll send a, a manufacturer salesman with our salesman to visit our customers. So I think that you have taken communication along with technology and are able to tell that story to more people. So I think it's the same thing. We're changing our businesses to adapt to how the market changes. And we have to be ahead of it because neither one of us can, could have someone else springboard ahead of us. So we have to always keep trying to re it, to innovate to keep staying ahead of the curve from my perspective. So if a traditional brick and mortar guy is listening to this conversation or or if all of a sudden tomorrow you owned a brick and mortar store, what, what would you do differently knowing kind of where you see things going? Is there anything you would immediately day one start doing or a path you would go down? In my brick and mortar experience, I always tried to obsolete myself. So I think it, it, I, what I would recommend is listen to your customers I think you need to have an online presence. Now, will you have a, a very successful online store? More than likely not. And what I mean by that is, if you open up a new branch location in a beautiful building, and you don't have a lot of inventory, and you don't have a salesman, and you have a lousy counterman, more than likely, you're not gonna do any business. But if you have a lot of inventory and great customer service and great counter people and good salespeople, you're gonna have a good branch. So I think people need to change with the times. I do think they need to, they don't have to build the best e-commerce business that they think they'll get business from all over the world. What they need to start doing is meeting the customers where they want them to be. So customers may want to order online 24 seven, they should enable that opportunity. And I think that they have to not be afraid of technology and they want to try to use it and, and continuously iterate and involve and, and, and make their business better by using digital components for that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think a lot of people that don't understand e-commerce just think, well, I'm going to go spend money. I'm going to pop up a store. I'm going to sell a million dollars in parts all over the United States. Yeah. It's not quite like that, is it? <laughs> no, I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think people don't understand. Like, just because it exists doesn't mean people buy from you. And it's different than a brick store. You know, brick and mortar, you're in a location. you got to build your awareness in that market. When you have an internet store, you got to build your location on the internet. It's a much bigger place with a lot more competitors. And all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of skill sets. And I'm sure you guys had to learn these as well. Pay-per-click and SEO and page optimization. Um, it's nothing you just 
build and, and let it rip. There's an no. extensive amount of time I'm sure you guys spend just managing your online store. Someone said to me the other day, you're the luckiest guy in the whole wide world. And I said, really? I said, you're right. I'm so lucky that I've been working 11 years every day, 50 hours a week to be lucky. <laughs> so I guess you're right. I'm lucky. But um, I do feel fortunate that the tides have turned as it relates to COVID. And I don't think anything's going to ever go back. I think as business owners, we learned uh, like virtual workers, like from my perspective, having remote people working for me has been the best thing that's ever happened to me because I can attract better talent from around the country and they get to work from home in, the, in an environment that works for them. I'm still able to manage them. So I'm able to grow my business and expand my reach by having other employees located not under my four walls. So, you know, it's just everything in our mindset. You don't have to, you know, if you couldn't see someone, you figure they're not working. So I think a lot of our mindsets have to change as COVID has changed our entire world. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I mean, when you really look at the reason, why does brick and mortar exist, right? The traditional reasons have been, well, they have inventory, they have knowledge, and they have distribution. Really, those are the three fundamental pillars on why a brick and mortar store exists to retail something. Well, all of a sudden you got your knowledgeable employees retiring, and yeah. you have the internet offering same day, next day delivery on most things now. Um, you're, you know, you got to have three legs to stand on. You, you can't just live off of, well, we can deliver to you the quickest or be the cheapest. Cause that's, that's a, that's a path of, of failure long-term. It's yeah. gotta be those other things, like you said, right? I mean, they need to be offering training. They need to be having great relationships. They need to make it, they don't need to sell to the entire world 24 seven, but they need to be able to sell to their customers 24 seven at yes. a minimum. So they, they have some challenges there. Um, and I know, and there's all kinds of things you can do. It's so like, I know on your website, I, I saw it on there. You have, you have a rewards program. Right. Mm -hmm. So explain, you know, that is, why do you have a rewards program? So what we're looking for is we want we want to reward customers for coming back. So it's easy. There's a term in the Internet like one and done. They buy from you once. You never hear from them again. So it's our goal to have repeat customers. So they begin their journey by coming to us to find a part that they weren't able to locate locally. So they might have called three or four of their your normal vendors, they couldn't find it, they don't know what to do, they Google it, they find us, and they buy from us and hopefully it's a good experience. So it's no different than the airlines giving away reward points or on your Amex. We're just trying to build customer loyalty. So we figure from our perspective, we're looking for the lifetime value of our customer, no one sale. So we're not priced so that if we make a sale, we do so great, we don't need to sell it again. It's our business is about repeat business. So for us, it's about getting our customers, making sure they're happy and having them continue to come back. So we're trying to build loyalty so that the customer remembers that we don't want to be an afterthought. We would like to be their third call. You know, their first call, I still fundamentally believe will be to their local distribution because classically, that's just the way that people like to buy. But as opposed to spending 15, 20, 30 an hour on the phone looking for things, it's much more efficient to go online because then you have full transparency. Because if you call and special an order from a brick and mortar, you're requiring a lot of people to do the right thing for that part to get to you. You know, the purchasing manager's got to call the store, you know, the, the distributor. They have to ship it. It has to get to the warehouse. The warehouse guy's got to bring it to the counter guy. He's got to call the customer. So it's kind of an inefficient process. And through buying online, it offers you that transparency that I think is changing the way the market operates. Yeah. And I will say this. I can't think of one single brick and mortar parts store that I've ever seen have a reward program, right? Probably because they didn't need to. And I, I think I think that's the thing. Business is evolving. People need to evolve. You're evolving your business. I, I think yes. when you look back where you started 11 years ago, you're, you're in a different spot. I know I am six years later. Yes. And, and I, I think that's the real differentiator is when I see the traditional brick and mortar, they haven't they haven't really evolved like they should have. But I think they're figuring it out, which is great. The industry needs needs everything that's happening there. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I love what you're doing on there on, on findaparts.com. So one of the big things I need to ask you about, because it's in the news every day. I see 70 ships off the port of Los Angeles. I see people talking about being out of parts everywhere. What are you guys seeing in the whole supply chain? Are you seeing shortages? What do you see happening in your world? So the benefit that we have is we have a one-to-many relationship. So if we took a SKU, um, brand X, 
we might have that part available from Brand X. We might have it from eight other sources. So what we're finding today that we had a meeting with one of the largest fleets in the country the other day, and his comment was that 95% of all of the needs that I have for my fleet in this local area were serviced locally. And that was historical. He said over the past 18 months, only 70% of the parts that I need are available local. So he says, I'm spending an inordinate amount of time locating parts that normally I would buy in my backyard. So what we're finding is OEM parts, aftermarket parts, up and down the supply chain, we have Cummins parts that we have available from like five or six people. We have, and we know where it's located. It might be in, in Detroit. We have another one that might be in you know, Tallahassee. And a distributor wouldn't know to call someone in Tallahassee to find that part. So what we're seeing a lot of growth is because we have so many suppliers for a part, people find it easier locating it from someone like ourselves as opposed to calling 25 different people. We even have situations that manufacturers are buying their own parts back from us that happens to be sitting in a distributor's location. So I think, I think the supply chain is not going to get better anytime soon. I don't know what your experience is. You know, we hear of chips are holding the manufacturing of automo automobiles back. So I think it's going to be with us for another six months to a year as everything starts firing back up. So we're seeing that's a lot of the reasons that people are being driven online. And as I think about your business, I mean, you're able to diagnose an engine, allow someone to diagnose a problem in a vehicle that 10 years ago, you had to go to the dealer to do that. I mean, think of how you've changed that market. So there's a perfect example of technology completely turning the world upside down. Yeah. And I, I think all this is great because at the end of the day, people just want their stuff fixed, right? Yeah. And and really, there's it, price is always a factor. But in our world of commercial truck, it's downtime and dwell time that, yes. that really kill it. And it's, okay, that part's another $10. Who cares? I'm spending $1,000 a day waiting waiting for my truck. Exactly. So I, exactly. I, th I think you made a great point there on the, on the one to many. And I'm assuming you mentioned you guys have a great cross-reference as well. Like we do a lot of times I'm assuming people, do people even know that sometimes there's aftermarket or alternative options or are they just convinced there's only one part that could possibly fit? I think many people know and, and everyone has their own bias. So some people say that brand X is the only brand to use. Like there's five seals brands and no matter what, someone wants to use brand X and not brand B, right? Whatever it is. So we offer a one to many. So if someone's looking up the OE part, we might have five other brands that are same fit form and function and we leave it up to the consumer to make that choice. We'll surface all the information, the features and benefits about each, and then we'll allow the customer make their choice. But if you looked at an OE part versus four aftermarket, you're gonna see you can buy it less in an aftermarket version, and then it's really up to the consumer, is it worth the difference? And we're not influencing them one way or the other. We're just serving up the options for them to make their own choice. You know, again, a very similar parallel to the diagnostic tools, because usually customers call us and say, hey, I want to work on X, Y, Z, right? Um, and then we say, we ask a couple of questions, what kind of functionality, what's your price range, you know, these things. And then we say, okay, great, we're consultative. Here's options A, B, and sometimes even C, right? And here's the pros and cons on each. So it sounds like a very similar thing you do with your customers. It is. And, and that's what people want. They want, what are my options? And I think that's, yes. that's what's been missing in a lot in our industry when you look at everything. Yes. Who can work on my truck? What part can I get to work on my truck? What should it cost? Like, they just want to know. Yeah. Exactly. So I think consumers are just like you and I. They're no different. The only difference is, is that when you're buying a consumer good online, um, eh, if your iPhone case doesn't show up today or tomorrow, it's not a big deal. But if you ordered a turbo and you need it tomorrow, it better be there tomorrow because someone has a truck that's down and goods need to go. So I think that's where the transparency and relying upon a good company that you can trust that when I ordered online, I am going to get it in two days. So I think that's really an important thing that you are transparent and you deliver on your promise. And that's like any other business, right? Yeah. I mean, how crazy is it we're in an industry where really a $10 part could hold up a hundred thousand dollar shipment going somewhere, right? And it, all the ripple effects it has over just parts availability at the end of the day. In, in my brick and mortar world, it used to drive me insane. I used to have a customer 
that would order like a, a driveline part from me and my competitor and whoever got there first got the order. <laughs> yeah. Like, really? Where's loyalty in this? It, it is. I can tell you in the automotive world, it is like that in some markets, oh right? They're, they're just going on websites. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order one from three people and whoever <laughs> shows up first, the other two can get sent back, right? It, it, exactly. It's brutal in exactly. that world. So Exactly. Well, I'll, so, I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you it's, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on here. I, I think, you know, we got to do another episode because I think I could sit here for hours and just talk to you about everything to. and parts and technology and change and, and all these things. And, you know, it's always great, too, for as a local CEO and founder to talk to another CEO and founder in the same industry trying to change the way things are done. A lot of parallels here. So it's always it's always great to Agreed. talk to you. Agreed. Uh, so if people want to get a hold of you, what is the best uh, way to do that? Go to findaparts.com www.findaparts.com. And if anyone wants to talk to me, you can just fire off an email to david at findaparts.com. I'll talk to anyone. So I really appreciate you giving me the floor here. I'm really, honestly, I'm, I'm very impressed with everything you're doing in your business. And I think that you're really transforming things. And it's an honor to be on the stage with you. Well, hey, I appreciate it. And I got to work you over about selling some diesel laptop products on findaparts.com. So hey, let's sure, make that I'm, happen. I'm sure I'll be hitting you up about that pretty soon. So, all, right, all right, my friend. Well, for everybody else, I just want to say thank you very much. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening, of course, we're everywhere. Podcasts are. We're on Apple. We're on SoundCloud. We're all over the place. And as I end every episode, it's not just diagnostics. It's diagnostics done right. And diagnostics always lead to a part you need to buy to fix your truck. Check out finditparts.com. They're a great company to work with. Thank you Thank for you. watching. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time.